So we are in the week of October 26th through 29th. We finished chapter 12. So we're actually going to go ahead and start chapter 13, spinal cord and spinal nerves. Next week, you will have a quiz over chapter 12. I uh, have a review sheet that's in the modules that you can use to uh, study for that or know what to study. So, but that is next week. All right. Okay, so we're going to be starting chapter 13 this week on spinal cord, spinal nerves, and spinal reflexes. Trying to zoom in a little bit so this is easier to see in, in the textbook, in the e-text. You have this uh, illustration to kind of understand the relationship between the spinal cord and the brain and the cranial nerves. All right. So you have sensory receptors in your brain as well, or actually not in your I mean, you've got reflex centers in your brain, but you've got sensory receptors in different parts of your body. All right, and they're going to send sensory input through nerves to the brain or the spinal cord. Okay, and then you'll have motor output that goes to different effector cells. Could be muscles, could be glands, could be adipose tissue. So in the case of spinal nerves, reflexes entering the spinal cord, okay, motor output, is going out through spinal nerves. For the brain, sensory input is sent to the brain via cranial nerves to reflex centers in the brain, and then they're sending out motor output over cranial, back through cranial nerves. Okay, I just wanted to, yeah. There should, so, all right. So apparently, because the dot cam won't show it. All right, so let's see. Let me put it back. All right, there we go. Okay. So just showing how sensory receptors send signal to the brain or the spinal cord. Motor signals will go out through uh, either cranial nerves or spinal nerves out to affect your cells. Okay. So in the case of the spinal cord, Sensory input goes through spinal nerves to the spinal cord. Motor output goes out through spinal nerves, okay, to affect your cells. We'll see in the next chapter how sensory input goes to the brain via cranial nerves, and then motor output goes to affect your cells, okay. So this is in your e-text in chapter thirteen. So just wanted you to be aware of it. All right, let me share. Okay, all right. We're actually gonna go through the full notes this time. So, tell you a little bit about the spinal cord, okay? So, Got structures involved that are helpful. So it tells you in addition to sending information to and from the brain, spinal cord is gonna in integrate information and process it on its own. Okay, structures that you'll see in the spinal cord or related to the spinal cord, things like the posterior median sulcus, the anterior median fissure, the cervical and lumbar enlargements, Conus medullaris, phylum terminal, and the cauda equina. Okay, so let's do another share so you can see some of those. We won't get to all of them right this minute, but we'll get to see a few. All right. All right, so here is a image from the textbook showing different parts of the spinal cord. All right. Try to be still so it's not shaking too much. All right, so you've got your cervical enlargement. Here's the cervical section of the spinal cord, thoracic section. All right, you've got your lumbosacral enlargement, conus medullaris. Here's your cauda equina. 
All right. Now, if you look at the a cross section or basically like a transverse section of the spinal cord, you can see structures like the anterior median fissure. This is toward the front of the body. Posterior median sulcus toward the back of the body. You have white matter surrounding gray matter. Okay, so as we'll see later, I'll just I'll introduce you to this posterior root or dorsal root, and a ventral or anterior root. Uh, you notice this is the posterior or dorsal root because of this spinal ganglion or dorsal root ganglion. All right, so just wanted to introduce this to you. I'll try to do a few of these as we go along. All right. All right, so as you saw, your spinal cord in the adult has got some localized or specific areas with enlargements that give innervation or nerves to shoulder girdles or pectoral girdle, upper limbs, pelvis, and lower limbs. There are actually 31 segments to your spinal cord. Each is associated with a pair, means two dorsal root ganglion, dorsal roots and ventral roots. All right, so dorsal or posterior roots and root ganglia have to do with sensory information. Ventral roots have to do with more motor information, okay? So the dorsal root ganglia has cell bodies for sensory neurons. Dorsal roots have axons of neurons that bring sensory information into your spinal cord. See, the ventral roots contain axons of motor neurons. They'll go into what we call the periphery of the body and they control somatic and visceral effector cells. <laughs> so like skeletal muscle and other types of tissue. Your sensory nerves are said to be mixed, or sorry, spinal nerves, excuse me, are said to be mixed because they have both afferent or sensory fibers and efferent or motor fibers. So your spinal cord is basically gonna enlarge and elongate till you turn around four years old. And then after that, your spinal cord is not really growing, it's really more the growth of your vertebrae, okay? It's carrying the dorsal roots and spinal cords further apart. Okay. Next thing we're gonna talk about are these spinal meninges, should be M-E-N-I-N-G-E-S. So you have meninges in your spinal cord area as well as near the brain. The spinal meninges will provide physical stability as well as shock absorption for your neural tissue in your spinal cord, for your nerves, essentially. And the blood vessels in the spinal meninges are going to deliver oxygen and nutrients to your spinal cord. So meninges are basically spaces with fluid, okay? So they help with shock absorption and stability. Now you also have cranial meninges, cranial because they're related to the brain. And they provide, again, physical stability and shock absorption for your neural tissue in your brain. And then just like the spinal meninges, the blood vessels in this layer will deliver oxygen and nutrients to the brain. So meninges, have three layers, dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater. Dura mater is the durable, tough <laughs> layer on the outside. Arachnoid space is in the middle, it's intermediate, and the pia mater is on the inside. 
So if you're going from outside to inside, it's DAP. If you're going from inside to outside, it's PAD. Okay, so here you have illustration of the spinal cord and spinal meninges. All right, so they've cut the layer. So here's your tough outer dura mater. In the middle, this webby-like structure is your uh, arachnoid mater. Inner layer is the pia mater, and they surround the spinal cord, provide shock absorption and stability. Okay, so that's what that looks like. So the dura mater is tough, it's fibrous, it's the outer layer. So dura, same root as durable, mater, same root as maternal, right? So this is like tough mother, okay? So uh, that's that outer layer of covering, providing that support. All right, so toward the tail of the body or toward the, the um, distal end of the spinal cord, I guess, well, distal really wouldn't be the right word to use in that case, more inferior end of the spinal cord. All right, it tapers to what we call a coccygeal ligament. All right, <clears throat> related to the dura mater is, is the epidural space. And it's, a, it's basically a place where there's separation between the dura mater and the walls of the vertebral canal. You get loose connective tissue there, blood vessels, adipose tissue. Now, related to that, you have the condition epidural block, provides a temporary sensory motor paralysis. It's gonna result from injecting anesthetic into the epidural space, and it affects spinal nerves in the area only, all right? So this is not permanent paralysis, okay? Not permanent um, ability to not feel pain, okay? Anybody know why people do this? Why do they put anesthesia in the epidural space? So can sometimes help mothers deal with the pain of childbirth, okay? That temporary sensory paralysis, okay? So next layer is the arachnoid. And it is deep or interior to the inner surface of the dura mater. Now in the arachnoid, you're going to find the subdural space. And it separates the dura mater from the deeper meningeal layers below. You also have what we call the subarachnoid space. And what we have here is cerebrospinal fluid. And as the name suggests, it's fluid that you'll find around the cerebrum in the brain and the spinal cord. Its role is to act as a shock absorber. Also helps to diffuse, dissolve gases. Remember, we learned about that with um, action potentials, right? And having messengers. Uh, it also helps diffuse nutrients, the chemical messengers, as well as waste products. And chemical messengers could be neurotransmitters, right? Okay, another procedure related to this is the spinal tap. And here, the medical professionals with drawing are taking out 
cerebrospinal fluid through a needle. It gets inserted into the subarachnoid space. And this is used to diagnose reasons for severe back pain, uh, for headaches, for intervertebral disc problems, as well as uh, some cases of stroke. So the Pia mater is the most inner, inner layer, the deepest layer of the meninges. And it's made up of elastic and collagen fibers. And unlike these more superficial layers or meninges above it, the, sub, the arachnoid and the uh, dura mater is actually bound to the neural tissue, bound to the nerves. So another medical issue related to this, remember medical issues make good matching, right, for the exams. So remember, itis is inflammation. So this is inflammation of the meningeal membranes. It could be due to an infection from a virus or bacteria, and it can actually uh, disturb the normal cerebral spinal fluids or circulatory fluids. And it can damage neurons or kill them, as well as the glial cells, the supporting cells. Okay. So I think we'll pause here. I'd like for you to discuss with your partner the uh, different layers of the meninges. You can do this at home as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more. Now that we've talked about the meninges, let's talk about the sexual anatomy of the spinal cord. Okay, so showed you a picture a moment ago with gray matter and white matter. So the white matter has to do with myelinated and unmyelinated axons. Okay, so they were both in the white matter. In the gray matter, you have unmyelinated axons, so you have no myelinated axons there. You have cell bodies and neurons, as well as you have glial cells. You get an H or butterfly shape in, in the sort of interior of the spinal cord. All right, so in the gray matter, you have these sort of uh, corners, which we'll call horns. And their projections of that gray matter toward the outer surface of that spinal cord. Now, usually when we use the term nuclei, we're talking about a nucleus inside a particular cell. So in this case, what we're talking about here, when we say nuclei, these are groups of neuron cell bodies. Okay, in the gray matter of the spinal cord. So collectively, we call that a nuclei. And it could be sensory or motor. Okay, so sensory nuclei are going to receive as well as relay sensory information. Motor nuclei are going to give out motor commands to some effector cell somewhere in the body. All right, so with the gray matter, you have posterior gray horns. So they're gray, they're in the gray matter, but the posterior means they're toward the back of the body. Okay. And they have somatic and visceral sensory nuclei. Somatic for skeletal muscle, visceral, pretty much everything else. Okay. Anterior gray horns have somatic motor nuclei only. And they're anterior because they're toward the front of the body. Lateral gray horns 
have only visceral motor neurons, okay? But the anterior side of the, of the spinal cord is for relaying sensory information. The dorsal side's more, or posterior side's more for relaying sensory information. All right, so we also have what we call gray commissures. And these have axons and they'll cross from one side of the spinal cord to the other side. So they're toward the, in the middle of the spinal cord. And you have a, all right. So on each side of your spinal cord, you have motor neurons that can control muscles. Do things like positioning the shoulder girdle, positioning the arm, moving your forearm and your hand, moving the hand and your fingers. Okay. So, so that's it's toward the side. Okay. So what does that look like? Let's start looking at image. All right, so here's your, more of your white matter, and here's your gray matter in the middle, okay? Remember the white matter, it's a combination of myelinated and unmyelinated axons, and your gray matter is basically unmyelinated axons only, all right? Here's your posterior side of the body. So this is a posterior horn, another posterior horn, anterior horns, okay? So right here is your posterior gray commissure, anterior gray commissure, where they cross over to the other side of the spinal cord, the axons that do that. The sensory nuclei are in the dorsal or posterior horn. The motor nuclei are on the uh, more of the lateral and uh, anterior horns. Okay. All right. Now, if we're looking at the sides, we'll get into the white matter in a minute, but we'll, we'll right now we're mostly just talking about gray matter. All right. This is what the same thing looks like under a microscope. You see the gray matter, white matter. Posterior, gray horns, anterior, white horns, or gray horns rather, anterior gray horns. All right. Okay, so we talked about gray matter. Now let's talk about white matter. So the white matter can be divided up into six columns, also known as funiculi. Okay, uh, don't get caught up in that word. So you have posterior, anterior, lateral white commissure, each of which is gonna contain tracts, which you also call fasciculi. These are bundles of axons. And they relay same type of information, whether it's sensory or motor, in the same direction. We also have ascending tracks and descending tracks. And these are going to relay information to the brain from the spinal cord. So going from the spinal cord to the brain in ascending tracks. That should make sense because the brain is higher, right? More superior. And then on the descending tracks, information goes from the brain to the spinal cord. So conditions related to this, multiple sclerosis, which causes muscular paralysis and loss of sensory control due to Demyelination of the axons. 
right? Polio, viral disease, remember from US history, you know, President Franklin Roosevelt had polio, causes paralysis by destroying somatic motor neurons. So again, he spent much of his presidency in a wheelchair. Okay, uh, quadriplegia, it is a extensive paralysis. Whereas paraplegia is loss of motor control in the lower limbs only. Okay, whereas quadriplegia is all four limbs. All right. Okay, so I want to give you a view of those columns real quick. So the six columns that we're referring to, here's your anterior white column, posterior white column, lateral white column. Okay, laterals more toward the side. And you have that on either side, so that three plus three is six, okay? Lateral white column, posterior white column, and anterior white column, okay? All right, so let's, I'm gonna give you a break to discuss the components of gray matter and white matter in the spinal cord with your partners. You can do this at your, I do this at home as well. Okay, so let's talk a little more about this peripheral distribution of, of these spinal nerves, how they distribute away from the spinal cord. So in the thoracic and upper lumbar portions, the first branch from your spinal nerve is gonna carry what we call visceral motor fibers. Again, they're not going to skeletal muscle, they're going to other tissues. To an autonomic ganglion of the sympathetic nervous system, uh, division of the autonomic nervous system. And that should make sense because again, visceral would be things like your smooth muscle, okay? Um, you really wouldn't want that to be your somatic because that would mean it's voluntary, right? So typical spinal nerve is going to have some different structures, going to have different rami. All right, you have a white ramus, and that has what we call preganglionic, so before a ganglion, myelinated axons, and it has a light color to it. Should make sense because it has myelin. We also have gray ramus. It has postganglionic unmyelinated fibers. Okay. And those innervate different glands and smooth muscles in the body wall, the wall of your inside of your body or your limbs. It has darker color because it's unmyelinated. Structure related to the gray ramus. You have the Rami communicantes. And these are basically another word for communicating branches. And it's a collective name given for gray and white ring All So you also have sympathetic nerves. These are postganglionic fibers that innervate visceral organs in your thoracic cavity. Okay, again, smooth muscle or muscles that are um, more um, involuntary. All right, you also have splanchic nerves, and these are sympathetic nerves. They're preganglionic fibers, and they travel, because they're preganglionic, they travel to the ganglion. Okay, you also have what we call dorsal ramus and ventral ramus. The dorsal ramus provides sensory information. Remember dorsal sensory or posterior sensory, uh, as well as motor innervation to the skin and muscles of the back. So it's really, that ramus is dealing with both sensory and motor information, but to the back of the body. The ventral ramus deals with what we call ventral lateral body surface, structures in your body wall and your limbs. 
Okay. So it's just more based on direction, not whether it's sensory or motor. Okay. Now the term I want you to know about are dermatomes. So these are parts of your body surface that are monitored by a pair, means two nerves. Okay. All right. These structures I want you to see. Here's an autonomic sympathetic ganglion up here. Okay. Here is your spinal ganglion. Here's an anterior ramus going to the front of the body. Posterior ramus going toward the posterior of the body. Okay. And here's your rami communicantes connecting your autonomic ganglion towards your anterior ramus. Okay. So I just wanted you to see those. So another section we're going to go over our nerve plexuses. And before you get again caught up in the word plexus, it just means a network. Okay. So it's a complex interwoven network of nerves. You have three large plexuses: the cervical plexus, brachial plexus, lumbosacral plexus. Okay. At least there's just three. So your cervical plexus. contains the ventral rami of the spinal nerves C1 through C5. Okay, C for cervical. These, the branches of these nerves will innervate the muscles of the neck, control your diaphragm muscles, and control major nerves. For example, the phrenic nerve is gonna provide nerve supply to your diaphragm. Okay, so that's the cervical plexus. Your brachial plexus is the ventral rami of the nerves C5 through T1. And those branches of those nerves are going to innervate the shoulder or, or pectoral girdle and upper limb, some major nerves. In this case, musculocutaneous nerve, median nerve, ulnar nerve axillary nerve and radial nerve. Okay, so even if you didn't know all these, you know radial sounds like radius, right? Has to do with the arm, which is brachial. Axillary has to do with the armpit, okay? Near the arm. Ulnar has to do with the ulna, okay? Now on the lumbosacral plexus, you have the ventral rami, of these lumbosacral nerves will supply your pelvic girdle in your lower limbs, right? It should make sense based on location. They can be divided into the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus. And the lumbar plexus contains spinal nerves T12 to L4. And major nerves in this plexus include genital uh, femoral nerve, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, and the femoral nerve. Right, so femoral has to do with the lower legs. The genital region has to do with you know, the lower portion of the body, pelvic girdle. Now the sacral plexus contains spinal nerves L4 through S4. Major nerves there include the sciatic nerve, pudendal nerve, perineal nerve, and tibial nerve. And you know tibial is gonna be, again, lower part of the body. All right, so another medical condition, the peripheral nerve palsies or peripheral neuropathies. These are losses of motor and sensory function in a certain region. 
and it results from nerve trauma or compression. Foot's falling asleep. All right, so let's take a look. All right, so here's a view of different nerve plexuses. So here's your cervical plexus, innervates muscles of the neck and diaphragm, includes the phrenic nerve, okay, down here. Brachial plexus, C5 through C1, pectoral grill and upper limbs. You got the axillary, musculocutaneous, radial, ulnar, median. Lumbosacral plexus includes lumbar plexus and sacral plexus. Lumbar plexus includes nerves like genital femoral, here, femoral. Sacral plexus. All right, major nerves of the sacral plexus are gluteal and sciatic nerves. Here's gluteal right there and sciatic. Okay, here's the sciatic nerve. All right. So let's take a break and talk with your partner about the rami and the nerve plexuses. Okay, so one thing we didn't get to discuss, there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Each has three layers, connective tissue, epineurium, which is the outer layer, perineurium, which is the intermediate layer, endoneurium, it's the innermost layer. Epineurium, again, is the outermost layer, made up of a dense network of collagen fibers, your perineurium, extends inward from your epineurium, divides your nerve into different compartments. Your endoneurium, this is your innermost layer, okay? And it's gonna surround individual axons. Now, in your epineurium and your perineurium, you're also gonna have arteries, veins, and capillaries, okay? So,
All right, so here is a view of a peripheral nerve. So surrounding the entire nerve is epineurium, right? Entire peripheral nerve. Now surrounding these individual fascicles, okay, you have perineurium. And then surrounding these individual axons, you have endoneurium on the inside here, okay? So this should seem very similar to another part of the body that we, we studied. You might remember? Muscle, okay? Similar. It's not exactly the same, but very similar, right? Okay. Another thing I want to show you are the dermatomes. So you have the anterior and posterior distributions of these dermatomes on the surface of the skin, okay? So... You can see the region, so blue is cervical, orange is thoracic, green is lumbar, and pink is sacral. Okay, and this is the anterior side of the body, and this is the posterior. Okay, it gives you an idea of kind of where in the body do the different nerves have control. Okay, all right. So let's talk about reflexes. So reflexes, has anybody had the doctor hit their knee with a little you know, thing? So they're looking at your patellar reflex there. And a reflex is just a rapid automatic response to some stimulus, okay? At the doctor's office, when they Hit your patella, that's the stimulus. Now, a neuroreflex is a automatic and involuntary motor response. So there's some effect or effector cell who's doing something. And it's automatic and involuntary by the nervous system. And it helps preserve homeostasis by rapidly adjusting functions of organs and organ systems. So a reflex arc, it's just the neural, what we call wiring of a single reflex. And I believe one of your potential essay questions has to do with the steps involved in a neural reflex. Okay, so it's important for you to learn that. So the first step, you have arrival of a stimulus and activation of some receptor. Okay, then you've got activation of some sensory neuron. Okay, so that's when that receptor gets activated, then you activate a sensory neuron. Then there's gotta be some processing of some information. Then you activate a motor neuron which leads to a response from a peripheral effector, okay? So reflex response is typically gonna involve, or it's typically going to remove or oppose your original stimulus, okay? So you usually need some negative feedback involved here. And the receptor some specialized cell, and it's going to basically look and see what's going on. It's going to monitor conditions in your body or your external environment. And each receptor is going to have their own, said to be characteristic, range of how sensitive they are. All right. Okay, so here's a visual illustration. Again, got the arrival of a stimulus, activates the receptor. It's like maybe they're touching a hot stove or something like that. And 
the activation of that receptor, because remember we have receptors in our skin, it activates the sensory neuron, okay? And here's the receptor activating the sensory neuron. Then you've got some information processing that's happened in your central nervous system. And yes, your spinal cord is considered part of your central nervous system. Remember, it's your brain and your spinal cord. Now, after the information processing has happened, now you have activation of a motor neuron. So here's a sensory neuron, the processing, inner neuron, activation of the motor neuron. Sends to signal to the effector cell, which has a response. Okay, you pick up hand. All right, so here's the stretch reflex, one we're probably most familiar with. Okay, stimulus is hitting the knee or hitting the patella. All right, and causes a stretch, a stretch in this muscle. Receptor in that muscle sends a signal to the spinal cord, which sends a signal to the effector cell, causes contraction, and you end up kicking your foot out. Okay, that's patellar reflex. All right. We'll get more into details of, reflex, of reflexes. All right, so you can classify reflexes according to their development. You can classify them according to where the information processing takes place. You can classify reflexes based on the nature of the motor response that results. And you can classify reflexes based on the complexity of the neural circuit. All right. Reflexes can be considered innate or acquired. So if the reflexes result from connections that develop between neurons while you're developing, okay, that's considered innate. So things like tracking objects with your eyes, suckling, chewing, withdrawing from pain, those are considered innate. Okay, the neurons that are responsible for that are going to be genetically or, pro or developmentally programmed. Now, acquired reflexes are learned motor patterns, okay, and they're typically more complex, using, like using the brakes in your car. You have to learn how to do it, but once you do it, you don't think about it anymore. So most reflexes can be modified over time or suppressed through conscious effort. All right. So for processing sites, if the information is processed in the spinal cord, it's a spinal reflex. If the information is processed in the brain, it's a cranial reflex. Again, because remember this relates to classification of reflexes, right? So we just covered site of information processing and we also covered development, okay? So I just wanna make sure that you know how this relates and while we're talking about it. So next we're going to talk about nature of the response. So reflexes can be somatic or visceral. If they have involuntary control over skeletal muscles, it's considered to be somatic. Okay, anytime usually when you see skeletal muscles, it has to do as do is somatic. All right, so So if you trip while running, you put your hands out to break your fall. Okay, that's a somatic reflex. Visceral reflexes are autonomic. They control activities in other systems. Now the 
fourth way to classify reflexes was complexity of the neural circuit. And it can be monosynaptic or polysynaptic, depending on how many synapses there are, right? Okay, simplest reflex arc, we have sensory neuron synapses with the motor neuron, okay, which acts as the processing center. That's monosynaptic because there's one synapse. A polysynaptic reflex has multiple synapses. At least there's going to be at least one, what we call interneuron. Between the sensory afferent and motor efferent. And it can have a longer delay between the stimulus and the response. And these can provide more complicated responses. Okay. All right. So let's take a break and talk about the steps in a neural reflex and classification of reflexes. Okay, and you can do this at home as well. All right, spinal reflexes. These are motor responses. They're triggered by specific stimuli, right? And because they're spinal, they're controlled by the spinal cord. As we said earlier, spinal reflexes could be monosynaptic or more complex polysynaptic reflexes. Okay, term we want you to be familiar with are the intersegmental reflex arcs. And here you have many segments that are interacting to produce a coordinated motor response. Okay, so there's lots of segments involved basically. Now for monosynaptic reflexes, we want you to know about the stretch reflex. That's the one we just talked about earlier, the patellar or knee jerk reflex. So it's monosynaptic, automatically regulates the length and tone of skeletal muscle. So the sensory receptors that are involved are called muscle spindles, and they're made up of intrafusal muscle fibers and extrafusal muscle fibers. Okay, so the intrafusal muscle fibers are innervated by sensory and motor neurons. Okay, related to those fibers is the nuclear bag. And it's the center or middle part of the intrafusal muscle fiber. And there you're gonna find dendrites of sensory motor neurons. And they're gonna spiral around. All right, for the extrafusal muscle fibers, you're responsible for the resting muscle tone. And as far as also responsible for contraction of your whole muscle. Okay, so your sensory neuron, it's always sending impulses to your central nervous system, to your brain and your spinal cord. And this is gonna provide what we call proprioceptive or just positioning information about your muscle. So when you stretch your muscle, it's gonna stretch your nuclear bag. And that's gonna result in increasing stimulation to your sensory neuron, right? That's just, that is definitely a stimulus. Muscle cell or muscle spindles are gonna elongate when they're stretched. And you get an increase in muscle tone and this reduces the chance the muscle is going to get damaged by overextension. Because of the increase in muscle tone prevents overextension. When you compress skeletal muscle, you're going to compress the nuclear bag. And that decreases the stimulation in your sensory neuron, which decreases or compresses your muscle spindles, which leads to a decrease in muscle tone. All right, and this helps reduce resistance to movement that's going on. Okay, so getting some compression reduces, reduces resistance to movement. All right, so the knee flex or patella reflex is a stretch reflex, and it's triggered by some passive muscle movement. Okay, so hitting the knee or patella 
region is not something you're doing actively, it's passive. Now, there are other reflexes like the postural reflex. And uh, these are mostly stretch reflexes. They help you maintain your posture. The postural muscles actually have firm muscle tone and they're very sensitive stretch receptors. So it just, it doesn't take a lot of adjustment in your postural muscles. Uh, and they're continually being made. These adjustments are being made uh, for you to have some sort of reaction, but you're usually not even aware you're doing it. Okay, so however you, however you, you know, sit normally, however you stand normally, your body naturally does that. Okay, you have to sort of train yourself to sit a certain way if you don't normally sit that way. So during a voluntary contraction, your central nervous system is going to adjust how sensitive the muscle spindles are. So the impulses are going to arrive over what we call gamma efferents. Okay, and those can cause contraction in myofibrils within the intrafusal fibers. Okay because they're efferents, they're causing a response, contraction. Okay. So. so again, kind of difficult to see, but here's a essentially a muscle spindle, right? So it's pointed on the ends, okay, these fibers running along the outside of the, of the spindle are extrafusal fibers. And these muscles on the inside are intrafusal fibers. So in, in the central area, that's where you have your nuclear bag. Okay. So these neurons are sending information from the central nervous system to the muscle. And these nerves are sending information to the central nervous system. Okay. All right, but these are your gamma efferents, okay? And they're sending information to the muscle to cause a contraction. But here, this whole region right here is your muscle spindle, okay? It's pointed. All right. All right, so I'll give you all a minute to talk about monosynaptic reflexes with your partners. You can do that at home as well. Okay, polysynaptic reflexes. We talked about the monosynaptic reflexes. Let's talk about the polysynaptic reflexes now. So the polysynaptic reflexes, because they involve more synapses, they can have more complicated responses, okay? So here you can have some muscles being stimulated and others being inhibited, okay? Because it's complex. So examples would include the tendon reflex and it monitors the tension that's produced during muscular contractions and it also prevents damage to your tendons. You also have the Withdrawal reflexes. These move affected portions of your body away from the source of stimulation. So again, this would be like if you put your hand on a hot uh, pan, frying pan, right? And you touch the handle and it's too hot, okay? Okay, and that is an example of a flexor reflex, which is a withdrawal reflex it affects muscles of a limb, okay? So that's a flexor reflex. Because you're in it and you pull your arm away, you're flexing your bicep. Or if you step on a rusty nail, you pick your foot up, flex your biceps for more. All right, so when a contracting or muscle contracts, the opposing muscle is gonna relax so you can move, okay? Because if it didn't, you wouldn't be able to move that limb. Okay, another concept, reciprocal inhibition. It's gonna prevent competition between opposing muscles. So when one group 
of motor neurons get stimulated. The neurons that control the opposite or opposing muscle. Remember we used the term antagonist, remember that? Okay, muscles that control the antagonist are inhibited. Now withdrawal reflexes, they're gonna be more complex than monosynaptic reflexes. Okay, and they're versatile, which means you can use them in different situations. Okay, related back to the concept of reflex arcs, we have the ipsilateral reflex arcs and the contralateral reflex arcs. So the sensory stimulus and motor response are gonna occur on the same side of the body if it's ipsilateral. The motor response is gonna occur on the opposite side of the stimulus if it's contralateral, okay? Also, you have the example for contralateral cross extensor, okay, reflex, and it's a contralateral reflex arc, and it complements your flexor reflex, but your cross extensor reflex and your flexor reflex are actually happening at the same time, okay? So, it is, let me show you example. All right, so. So here's our withdrawal reflex, okay? Moving the hand out of the way and it's a flexor reflex, okay? Affecting muscles of the limb, okay? Here's your crossed extensor reflex, person stepping on a nail. Okay, so you have flexor stimulated in the biceps femoris, so it'll be able to pull, pick your foot up. All right, but you also have flexor stimulated in your other leg to keep that leg extended, okay? You have flexors inhibited here in this leg, so you don't move that foot. And you have flex extensors inhibited here, so you you actually flex your leg, don't keep it extended. Okay, so there's what's happening in your spinal cord. You have a signal that essentially crosses over. Okay, so the signal is in one leg, comes to the central, comes to the spinal cord, and you have a crossing over. So that you have signals going to the other leg. All right, so that's why it's crossed extensor. Okay. Yes. Uh, it's similar. This is walking is something you do normally, whereas this is like if something happens while you're walking. It's a good question. All right. So, all right, so let's just finish this part up real quick. So all the polysynaptic reflexes involve collections of interneurons, okay? So they have to have interneurons to be polysynaptic. They're intersegmental, okay, in their distribution. They involve what we call reciprocal innervation. Okay, so it's coordinating muscle contractions, reducing resistance to movement. Okay, so it's, there's a reciprocal effect. Have, they have reverberating circuits and they're gonna prolong the reflexive motor response. So you get positive feedback between the inner neurons. Processing pull maintains the stimulation. So it's not, this part's not negative feedback, it's positive. And you have several reflexes that can coordinate to produce a coordinated response. So when a reflex movement's happening, the antagonistic reflexes get inhibited. Okay, we just saw that. So we'll stop here. I'll allow you to uh, do your exit tickets and we will pick up here in the next video.